Anybody in a busy season right now? Things are moving really fast. I, I don't know what it is about this time of year. You go from like summer vacation or maybe you got a week away and you feel so relaxed you could take on the world and then like you get a week into the school year and all that's out the window. And so today we're going to talk about what it looks like to lead a balanced life. And in particular, if we want to learn how to lead a balanced life as a Christian, we're going to learn from the ways of Jesus in Luke chapter 6. So power on your Bibles or turn in the one in your book rack to Luke chapter 6. And I'm eventually going to get there. Uh, it's been a busy season for uh, me as well. Just on Friday night, Fight Club kicked off. Thank you. And it, it was an amazing, it's my first time going to the Fight Club kickoff. With the, see 400 men up there from all different churches and just saying the next 10 weeks we're going to prioritize putting God in our relationship and working on all aspects of our life. And it was such a cool thing except for the thing started at 1130 at night and I had to go there on Friday night at 1130. And when I was doing burpees at 1:30 in the morning, I second guessed whether God was the one running this thing or not. And I was there till 2.30 in the morning, and then I had to get up at 8 a.m. so I could make it to a four-year-old soccer game. Yeah. Have you ever been to a four-year-old soccer game? And my son, like, literally just turned four, and there were kids that were, like, I'm convinced 18. But some of them were, like, you know, they take fifth, you could be five years old. So... He had literally, I learned that I've failed many ways as a dad, but I had never taught him anything about soccer. And so he gets out there, and sometimes he was running around, and he's trying to kick, and he was doing all the stuff, and he'd look over and wave. And then other times he would just go, hmm, I'm kind of done with this. And he would walk over to the sideline and start chatting it up with the guys over there, drinking from his water bottle. Ball would go by. He just didn't care. And so when he finally got out of the game, I was like, thank you, coach. And I went over around to the sideline, and I was like, I need to teach him this. So I was like, hey, Jet, you want to learn how to play soccer? He's like, yeah, yeah, I want to be good. And I was like, really? You want to be good at soccer? Yeah. I was like, great. Come over here, and I'll teach you. We can practice right now. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> what do you mean you don't want to do that? Oh, you want to be good at soccer. You got to practice. You want to be good. Nope, don't want to. I want to just go out there. I'm going to be good. Watch me, Dad. And I was like, no, you have to learn and practice how to become good at soccer. And so we had this little argument. Finally, he goes, Dad, I'm going to be good, and I don't have to do what you tell me to. I'm going to do what I want. It's like, you're four years old. What's wrong with you? It's your mother's genes there, I can tell right now. <laughs> and uh, not true, but uh, needless to say, <laughs> we got a little work on the soccer game. But it taught me a little thing. Like, I realized sometimes spiritually, when I'm in busy seasons, I don't know about you, or when it comes to life in general, of what it means to follow Jesus and learn his ways, if I want to balance life as we're talking about today, more often I look like a spoiled toddler in my spiritual walk with my heavenly father than I do a mature Christian. Because the truth is, there's certain things I just don't want to do. And I think I do in my head, but I don't want to do the painful hard work experience that it takes to learn the ways of our Savior. And that's at the heart of what I'd love to discuss with you today. Our theme verse uh, for this morning is, comes from John 15, verse 4, where it compares Jesus as the vine and we are the branches. And it says, remain in me, Jesus says, as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. As you remain in him and you learn his ways this morning, the difficult part of that is it takes submission, it takes surrender, it takes humility, and sometimes it even takes pain. And I want to share that with you. Ready to study God's word together. Luke chapter 6, beginning in verse 12, says this, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Now, I love the Gospel of Luke. I love Luke in general, because Luke was a details guy. Do we have any detailed people out there? I know we got some dreamers, but uh, Luke was a detailed guy. See, he was someone who had come to Christ through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, and he had followed the early disciples and learned the stories of Jesus, and he wrote an account of the good news, the Gospel of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. It's in his book, uh, Luke named after him. And then it was a two-part book. The second part was Acts. We looked at Acts chapter 4 last weekend, the Acts of the Apostles, the sent ones, as we'll discuss. And so he wrote this account of Jesus' life, death, and re resurrection, and then how the early church expanded rapidly all over the Roman Empire. 
And I love Luke because unlike some of the other disciples, uh, he was not uh, uneducated. Most of the disciples, as we'll see here in this passage, are called by Jesus to follow him, and they are the unqualified guys. They're essentially the teenage, uneducated young men who were passed over by all the other rabbis, and rabbi just means teachers. So like John, the disciple, he writes the Gospel of John, he writes 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and gives the account of the Revelation. Those books of the Bible are actually very easy to translate. little history lesson here. You may not realize this. The New Testament is actually written in Koine Greek, not like Homer's uh, Odyssey or any of that. Uh, it, it, that's ancient Greek. This is Koine Greek during the first century A.D. when Jesus was walking on the planet for 33 years. And in that particular uh, time period, Koine Greek had a lot of complexities, just like the English language. And so John, the disciple, writes in a very easy, simplistic version of Greek. People like me can even translate it. But Luke, on the other hand, uses much more complex language because he was an, un, he was an educated man, most likely a first century version of a physician. And so his, the Greek written there is much more complex, and he gives us little details that you don't find in the other Gospels. And I love some of the details in this passage that we get. The first verse I read in verse 12, it talks about that right before, in the verses that preceded that, we learn that Jesus had healed a man on the Sabbath. And that had upset some people. And then he's going to, in verses 13 to 19, call these 12 guys to come and follow him and to go out and live on mission. But it pauses and it records this one verse there in verse 12 that Jesus first went to the mountainside to pray. Jesus was constantly doing this. It sets the precedent for how important it is for us to first connect with the Lord and be filled by him to not reject his discipline, to lead a balanced life the way that Jesus did. He wasn't just doing for his heavenly father, he was being with him. It goes on in verses 13 uh, to 15 and says, when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he also designated apostles. Verse 14, Simon, whom he named Peter, he names each of them by name. His brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, my favorite, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, and the one I really feel bad for, Judas, son of James, right? Like, how bad is it that there were two Judases the rest of your life? You're always confused for the other guy. And then Judas Iscariot, he was the one that was really the traitor, not Judas, son of James. These 12 young men who were largely uneducated, who had been passed over by other people, he calls to come and follow him. He's going to trust the future of Christianity in their hands. Now, some of you are here today, I imagine many attending here or watching or attending online, and you probably feel like you want to know about going to heaven, but the idea that God could actually use you, <laughs> that's never going to happen because you're just not one of those super Christians. You're not one of these 12 original disciples. Well, two things. First of all, God used a bunch of uneducated teenagers who may or may not have been able to read or write when he first found them, and he entrusts them with the keys of the kingdom. So I'm pretty sure if he could use those guys, he could use you. But secondly... In this passage, what I love that is going on here, he not only calls them to him, he's going to lead them out to live on mission in a way that actually challenges them and transform them. And for, for some of you here today, you need to hear that God wants to invest in your life, that you were created for a purpose and a plan. It's a good one. And he wants to utilize everything he's entrusted in your life to make an impact for eternity. The verses go on, and it says in verses 17 to 19, he went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples were there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around here in Sodom. So if you have heard that term, as I said earlier, disciples, and you think of these 12 individuals, these young and uneducated men, you don't understand what the word disciple means. There were literally hundreds, if not thousands, of disciples that were learning the ways of Jesus. So remember the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5? Thousands of people are coming out to hear what he, this teacher, this rabbi, has to share. And so the, the 12 that he calls, they refer to them as apostles, they're the sent ones. These are the ones he's really going to pour more of his life into. But there were many disciples from all over the region, all the way up to Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. They tr they, those troubled by impure spirits were cured. And the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him healing them all. But then he was doing all of this so that he could go out to help those in need 
and proclaim the kingdom of God. That's a big message throughout the New Testament. He's proclaiming that the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Inviting them into a relationship with their heavenly father to spend eternity with him in heaven and experience him in their life now. And that he is giving them the power and the authority that you see in this passage he is giving to those that he is discipling. And especially these sent ones, the apostles, as we'll talk about at the very end, he's empowering them to live out this uh, threefold uh, way of living a balanced life as a Christian. That's what I'd love to discuss with you. Will you pray with me? God, I pray for every person in this room right now or even attending online from wherever they're at in the world. We pray, Lord Jesus, that we've all gathered here, packed out this space, run out of chairs, because we want to hear from you. Not me, not anybody else here. We want to hear from you. We acknowledge your presence here with us. We pray that you would speak to us. May you take my words away, replace them with what you desire. May we hear your heart in Scripture. We love you, Jesus. Help us to lead a balanced life as a follower of you. We pray this in your name and all God's family said, amen. 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 If you're new with us this morning, you're walking into week two of a four-week teaching series called Underground Jesus. Last week, we talked about what it means to make Jesus Lord, and we're talking about our four movement makers that are the four banners you see in our hallway out there. It's why it's our flagship series that we do once a year. And this week, you're beginning to get some of the underground aspect of what we're discussing, why we call it Underground Jesus, because you, there's a whole part of our church that if all you do is attend the worship service, you will never see because it's the part that's doing discipleship and mission out in the communities. And so this week, we want to talk about our model of ministry, which is to follow Jesus up in and out. And we chose, I chose one passage, Luke chapter 6. We could have looked at a lot of others where you see these three areas uh, that Jesus focused on, and I want to break those down for you. But I mentioned this term there, rabbi means teacher, and mathetus means learner. That to be a disciple, mathetus, just means that you are a learner. You are learning the ways of Jesus. And we have a particular way that we do that here as a church, and I want to share that with you and give you a glimpse of it. But I want to forewarn you that if you actually live this out, every single one of us is going to struggle in one of these three key areas. And if you want to see growth, spiritual growth and discipleship happening, learning sometimes can be hard or even painful. You may know that from your personal experiences, but let me give you an example. I mentioned my four-year-old son. My 10-year-old, when he was three years old, he got a bike for Christmas. It was one of those little 12-inch bikes that are so tiny he didn't know they existed. It was a tow mater bike from the movie Cars. And he was so excited to get it, but it was the winter time, so he would ride it in the house. And it had little training wheels on it, it super cute, and he'd just ride it around the house because we'd let him because he's three and we didn't care because we didn't have as many kids then. But then what happened was spring finally hits. He's so pumped. He's now an expert because he's ridden around the inside of our house on this little thing with the little training wheels. We get out there. We're going for a walk in our neighborhood. He's riding on the sidewalk along, and he's wanting to impress his parents, and he sees the curb coming up. Some of you can see what's about to happen. He decides he's going to impress his parents, run his, drive, or ride as fast as he can and jump the curb. He, run, he gets those pedals going super fast for a three-year-old. He hits that curb, and you can picture what happened. Went over the handlebars, smacked face down right on the road. Now, when something like that happens, there are two kinds of people in the room right now. And before you judge my wife and how she responded, I just want to let you know she's actually the compassionate one. But at this particular moment, I would like to talk about how a compassionate father I was as I ran over to our son. And I was like, Jake, are you okay? Are you all right, buddy? I love you. Not everyone does, but I love you, Jake. And, but my wife, she has this thing, and I know some of you do where when someone has a traumatic fall like that, your first response, no matter how much it hurts you and how much you care, she can't help it. She does what? She laughs. How many of you, you're a laugher? Yeah, shame, 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 shame. Just kidding. She just can't, it just comes out naturally. She starts laughing hysterically. And the three-year-old looks up, he's crying. He sees his mom laughing at him. He takes off running down the street, slams the door, and leaves his tomato bike in the street. He doesn't ride a bike again for five years. 
Because sometimes learning how to do things, he thought he had this thing figured out. And then when he wrecked it and everything, now, by the way, my wife felt horrible. And she tried, we tried so hard for many years to get him to go back out there. And eventually, now he rides all over the, you know, town and he's without handlebars. He takes his hands off and all that. He, he loves riding his bike now, but he's a lot older. He, he got hurt in that moment and he didn't want to get back on the bike. I know there are some of you, as we talk about these three areas, you have tried before. And you have been hurt, whether it was done to you, a leader that you trusted or even a pastor at a church hurt you, created a lack of trust and a painful experience for you. Maybe it was you shared in a group context and somebody gossiped and talked about you behind your back. Maybe it was you tried to grow in your faith and you couldn't hear from God like other people could. Or, or maybe you tried to get over that addictive habit or see healing brought in a relationship and it didn't work out the way that you had desired. I understand it. But following the ways of Jesus is a process and sometimes it's hard and sometimes there are layers to it. Sometimes you have to walk through some stuff. The truth is today, if some of you that walked in this space want to be transformed by God, to be more close to him, to make a greater impact with your life, you're going to have to go through some pain and suffering to experience it. And you're going to have to get back up on that bike. If you're taking notes from uh, Luke chapter 6, I want to share a few things. See, Jesus had a pretty simple model of ministry. He created disciples that understood how to worship God. He invested in a few, and he sent those few people out into the world to make an impact. And I want to tell you that um, I believe, I love all churches. I don't care if they're 20 people or 2,000 2, people or 20,000 people. Any church that is presenting the good news of Jesus Christ and people are receiving that and being discipled and living on mission, I love any church and we got to stop, like, hating on other churches. Love all models, anybody that's leading people to Christ. You're going to hear our unique DNA, but I want you to hear my heart. We love all churches. Jesus kept it pretty simple, and we keep it pretty simple. But here's the issue in the American church culture. It's not a critique of any church. We have a major discipleship problem. Let me explain what I mean. That there are lots of great ways to work on ourselves as disciples of Christ. And I love all these things I'm about to share. Like, if you're struggling with financial debt... Right? Like you just have so much credit card debt, you don't know how to get out of it, and you keep spending. You need, not kind of, you need to go to Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University or one of the other versions of it. It's going to help you. It's going to teach you some ways to be a wise steward of the finances you've been entrusted with. For some of you, if you're here today and you're struggling in your marriage relationship, you need to go to the Significant Marriage Seminar this fall. You need to have someone invest in you. You need to learn healthy habits. You need to go to a Christian marriage and family therapist and work on those issues. If you have an issue, you need to work on it. You need to learn wise counsel. Absolutely. Whatever your area is. But if that's all you do, you will never get to the heart of the why you're having the issue in the first place. And this is the problem too much in the American church. We do great with our programs, but we don't get to the heart of the issue. What was the one thing that Jesus said, told us to do? His one command. Go, therefore, the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make what? Accountability groups of all nations. No, small groups of all nations. Is that what it is? It, go, therefore, and attend programs of all nations. He said, go, therefore, and make disciples. Disciples is a particular relationship. There is a rabbi, a teacher, and a mathetus, a learner, that's going to learn the ways of the disciple. And I love all those things I just mentioned, but if we don't get to the root of the issue of being discipled and making disciples, we will never see the true life change that we're designed. Let me explain. You could go to Financial Peace University, get really great stewardship of your resources, and become a greedy person in the process. You could go get a healthy marriage and be healed and be able to have a long, life, joyful life together, but Christ isn't at the center of your relationship, and you are not making the spiritual impact he designed for your marriage to make. We could do that in every different issue. We don't just have a problem with our marriage or a problem with our finances or the other things. We have a discipleship problem. A spiritually healthy disciple will find balance in these three areas that I'm about to share. And uh, this is not only our model of our church ministry, but of our model for discipleship for you as an individual. And the first one is this. It's really simple. Follow Jesus up. Following Jesus up. Luke uh, 6, 12, what did he do? One of those days, he, he went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. He had just been critiqued for healing on the Sabbath. He's about to go out to thousands of people and call just these few to follow him. 
It was kind of a stressful season, and he took that one verse to get away and spend time with his heavenly father. The up vertical relationship with God. How are you doing with that? No guilt trips this morning. No shame. Just honesty. How are you doing with that? Do you love your heavenly father? And you're going to go through seasons where you feel that and you experience it. But Jesus was constantly getting alone with his heavenly father. And my question is, when do you get alone with God? How do you worship God? Where do you practice spiritual disciplines that draw you, draw you close to God, to study the Bible, his word, to spend time in prayer, to come together and worship? In fact, that's why we do what we do on the weekends the way we do it. We could play fewer worship songs. That's pretty typical in our culture today. And we could actually, uh, you know, kind of dumb down the worship experience to make it not so, you know, a little more seeker friendly, so to speak. And I don't have anything wrong if that's somebody's model of ministry, but we believe our job is to get you to see that we really mean what we're talking about. And we want to worship our heavenly father and demonstrate that up vertical relationship because what's really going to change your life is not just some good practices, some good teaching, but it's actually a relationship with God yourself. And if you could encounter him here, you can do it outside of here, but if you can encounter him here, you will fall in love with him, and he's the one that will transform your life. That's John 15, 4, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You can go do for the Lord all day, but if you don't remain in him and be with him, it will be frivolous and on your own human abilities and not on the Spirit of God using your life. I was talking to Pastor Darren this week uh, about some of this, and we were just talking about all the different models of ministry out there. And here, I can tell you this. I don't care what church you go to. I don't care what model it is. The excuse for why you're not growing closer to the Lord and your up vertical relationship, it, it's not because of the model of ministry. It's not because of the church. I can't, there's no shame or guilt, okay? It only lies on me, you, as the individual. No one is preventing us from our up vertical relationship, but ourselves. Amen. And I find so often we hide behind things and make excuses for why those things are happening. Now, let me tell you this. If this is the area that you struggle with because you just, you try and pray, you don't hear from God. You don't even know how to pray. You don't even know how to study the Bible. You don't understand any of it. I'm not really talking to you. You need to go to the end part that I'm about to describe where you learn the ways and how to do that. But for those of you that already know those things and you're not finding that, that's the only thing that's preventing you from that relationship with God. Number two, if you're taking notes, we need to follow Jesus up. We also need to follow him in. Look at verses 13 to 16 with me again. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles, and then he names them by name. He is going to have an intimate, intentional, discipling relationship where he is the teacher and they are the learner. And they are going to commit to learning from this particular rabbi, this teacher. So for those of you who are here, if you have never been discipled, and, I, and most people in American churches, they have never had this happen. If you have never been discipled by someone or intentionally discipled anyone else, we are failing to do the one thing Jesus told us to do before he went to be with his heavenly father, which was to make disciples of all nations. That's why we use rooted as a first step to discipleship. You're in groups during that time together, but it's just the initial step. I'll talk about what our long-term discipleship looks like. And the ushers are coming forward now. They're going to actually hand out these clipboards. We go old school on this because we want you to see how important that is. We want every single person to go through rooted, our 10-week discipleship experience. It kicks off September 11th. You'll come together on Wednesday night, but you're doing a devotional throughout the week. Uh, we also, if you can't do Wednesday nights for the first time, we are offering it different days of the week. So still fill it out and we'll get you connected. It's the one thing we want everyone to do in our church. That's how important it is. But that's not the only thing we do for the end discipleship aspect. He invested in just the 12 or even just the three where he pulled Peter, James, and John into an even deeper discipling relationship. My question to you is who are you following Jesus with? Who are you investing in or who has been investing in you? See, I want to share now something that's going to be totally new for everyone in our church. We haven't even had time. This is hot off the presses this morning. We haven't even had time to share this with all of our leadership in our church. We're going to be going over it with all of our leadership meetings coming up in the month. Don't miss the directional leadership meeting or the outpost leader meeting. But we, uh, 
we are doing the same thing we have always done, but we are going to uh, tweak just a couple of things. And I want to share that with you. If you've always wondered, well, okay, I've come to a worship service. How do I get involved, engaged in the life of Mercy Road Church? Let me share our engagement pathway plan with you. It goes like this. First, you come to a worship service. Now, I want to stop there for a second because many people, their first impression of our church may or may not be the worship service. And that's great. We love that. But you're here at a worship service, so we're going to share what this looks like for you. We really want you to do one thing. We want you to go to the first step class. It's coming up soon. We do it once a month. I do a one-hour class where you hear the vision of our church. And there's two things we want you to do after you come to that class. We want you to either volunteer in the church because you're already coming on the weekends. You can meet lots of people that way. You get plugged in. It doesn't take a lot more additional effort of your time during the week. And the second thing is we want you to go to Rooted. We want everyone in our church, again, to go to Rooted. It's a great overview of the Christian worldview, teaching you how to learn the ways of Jesus. In 10 weeks, you're in a group together. It's a great experience. Out of Rooted, though, we have two key areas we want you to go to. One is the in or discipleship network part of our church. And within that discipleship network, the in part of our church, there are two aspects of that. The first one is our discipleship huddles. If you're like, dude, what's a huddle? I watch football. What's it have to do with church? It is an intentional discipling relationship where one person is sharing everything they've learned about Christ, and, they, and you are learning the ways of that particular teacher, investing in your life. It's a, at least a one-year committed discipling relationship, and as the goal is at the end of that, for those who are spiritually ready, they would go on to disciple other people. And to those who aren't, they might stay on for another year or two and continue to be discipled. The other, uh, one of the changes that is new for us as a church, we have always done that the way they did in the New Testament, which was, it wasn't a program, you didn't sign up for it, it was just invite only. What we've seen over time is, though, we have a number of people who want to be discipled, and we have a number of people who want to disciple people, but they're not getting connected enough. And so for the first time, out of Rooted, while people who are leaders of, of uh, huddles can still do invite only, for those that are like, I'm open to discipling anybody, they are going to offer at the end of Rooted for the very first time that huddle leaders could have a, a huddle that someone could openly join. Now, once you join it, it's closed, and it's a year-long commitment. It'll be the hardest thing you've ever done. Don't commit to it if you're not going to stick with it, but it's a one-year discipling relationship. Another thing that we're clarifying, we've kind of on and off offered occasional Bible studies. I want to apologize to you as a church. The number one thing that transformed my life when I received Jesus as my Savior was to read the Bible on my own. And while we teach the Bible on the weekends and we uh, teach the Bible some in our discipleship huddles and in our community outposts, uh, we, I don't feel like there is enough intentional Bible study happening in the life of our church. And we're going to correct that. We'll still do it in all the other areas, but we're going to, for the first time, begin to offer just intentional Bible studies including uh, at 9 a.m. this fall, Kathy Craig, our discipleship pastor, is going to be offering a uh, Bible study at 9 a.m. in room 7 that you could join. If you want more info on that, email kathy at mercyroad.cc. And we see both of these within the greater discipleship network as a multiplying entities of discipleship huddles and Bible studies eventually, although the Bible studies will start a little more slowly. Secondly, we want to get you not only connected to our discipleship network, the in, Jesus called the 12 and the 3 and invested in them, and we're calling you to live that way, but the out. And let me uh, read the verses of the out on the notes if you want to skip ahead here just for a second. Luke chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around here in Sidon, who would come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured. All the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him, healing them. And then he will send the 12 and even the 72 to live out that outward focused ministry as well. That's what our out is. Point number three, if you're taking notes, uh, that we don't only follow Jesus up and in, we follow Jesus out. We follow Jesus out. Thank you guys. You're doing a great job. Can we put that slide back up there to demonstrate? Eventually, we see in our outward focus mission network, and we're using mission as a twofold mission to help those in need and to share our faith, the outward portion of our church. There are three different aspects of that. Much of this has not changed except for that first word. We've been using the term community outpost. We don't feel like it's robust enough 
to exemplify the vision we have for that, we are going to start referring to those as microchurches. Uh, that literally, on a smaller scale, those uh, people meeting in homes in microchurches, those are open, and they're going to study the Bible together, and they might worship together, they might share communion together. And this has always been the vision. It's just kind of changing the term that we're using. And they meet through homes throughout the city. But it's, uh, they live on mission together. They're kind of doing the five-fold ministry all in one smaller place where the, the up top, the inward neck, would just focus on the, the shepherding and teaching. Finally, those ministry outposts and outreach outposts are specifically outward while the micro church is out in the community inviting your neighbors over to your house for church right in your home. The ministry outposts and outreach outposts look like this. Ministry outposts fulfill the ministries you would typically find in a church like us. You know, uh, men's ministry, like Fight Club, uh, women's ministry. We had a great women's event here just a few weeks ago. Uh, addiction recovery ministry. We have a couple of options of those here at our church. Uh, we've got sports ministry. We could go through all the typical ministries, marriage ministry that you would find at a church. The difference is staff members do not run that for us. We believe in the priesthood of all believers that God could use a bunch of uneducated teenagers. He could use you. And the day of professional Christians has to be over because it's unbiblical. That God could empower you. And we have so many more ministry outposts. That's one of the fastest growing areas in our church because we have literally empowered you. We, you can apply for financial grants and some of those become their own nonprofits that we live in partnership with in our church. And then our outreach outposts. Those are ones that are going more to different parts of the city to help those in need and proclaim the kingdom of God. Some of them are going into the inner city, working down with urban youth. Some of them are working with homeless. Some of them, like uh, Wrestling Theology Fellowship, is an outreach outpost, and they literally turn this building right here into a wrestling ring and put on wrestling shows and tell people about Jesus. And we've had a bunch of people come to Christ through that, which I told Rich Abbott would never happen, and it did happen. Because we believe in empowering people and not controlling everything with a hierarchical leadership pattern. So if you see all of this up here, this is who we are as a church. This portfolio, so to speak, is who we are as a church. We follow Jesus up, in, and out. Those simple steps, and these are the areas that we want to live uh, like Jesus is represented here in this passage. Now here's the question I want to ask you. If you come to the worship service, but haven't gotten engaged in what I'm referring to as the underground aspect of who we are, the stuff on the right that you won't see here on the weekends, if you come to the worship service and aren't there yet, are you a part of Mercy Road? Yeah, definitely. You are a part of Mercy Road. And this worship service is helping you engage. And I think sometimes in our culture, we undervalue what coming together is really all about. And when we worship together and we have talented musicians and we worship God and what happens in that moment, it's what happens throughout the Bible, by the way. It's incredible how we can connect with God together. I love, the, I love weekends. I love that aspect of who we are and what we do as a church. But you know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't go, hey, let's transform the, the, the course of human history, make disciples of all nations. Uh, Peter, James, you go get the haze machine. I'll get the lights. It's going to happen. Right? Like, I, I love that aspect. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it can enhance opportunities that we have on the weekend. But, but Jesus was about all three of these areas. And in the in area, if you are in a discipleship huddle or a Bible study in our church, and you're not in the other areas yet, I want to tell you, you're a part of our church. If you're in a micro church, and that is meeting your spiritual needs and growing you as a disciple and helping you live on mission in your community, you are a part of Mercy Road Church. And some of you are going to be involved in a lot of different aspects of this, and some of you are just going to be involved in a couple of aspects of this. Because that's where you're at in this season of life. We have to stop pressuring people and tell them you got to fit in our system and do it this way. We want to offer this to you. To, so how can you grow in your up, in, and out relationship with Jesus Christ? Because I believe that the local church is the hope of humanity. And I think we have to stop saying that we got to control things and say we want to empower you to figure out what's best for you spiritually. Because our culture is crying out for it. Those verses I read about the out, Jesus going out in the ministry, the word apostles literally means sent ones, that we are sent out to teach other people the ways of Jesus. You were called to go and make disciples, and if they're not, our faith is dead. And there are some of us in those three different areas, we got hurt along the way, and we've been in a corner for a while, not in the game, and we need to get back up on the bike. You wrecked it once, but it's not over. 
I need you to say, I'm going to grow again. I may not be hearing for the Lord that much in my up relationship, but I'm going to surround myself with the people in a way that I can begin to connect with him again. I'm going to learn how to pray. I'm going to learn how to study the Bible. I'm going to do these things. I've never been discipled. I'm going to get discipled. I'm going to make disciples. I've never gone out and lived on mission out in the community to help those in need and to share my faith, and I'm going to change that. It's all going to look different starting today, but it's not going to be easy. It's going to be hard if you want to allow the Spirit of God that's in the room to transform you right where you're at. I want to end with this. Over the years, I've, I've seen people begin to allow God to transform them in their lives, and it's not always easy. And one example is a 19-year-old named Cody in Southern California that uh, I got the opportunity to minister to, and I lived out there for seven years. And his grandparents loved him enough to not give up on him, even though he got filled with hate. And he had become part of a neo-Nazi gang in Southern California. And he had this giant swastika on his arm. And they said, God created you on purpose, for a purpose. And they began to just pray for him and go out and reach him. And they invited him into their home. They said, you can live with us if you begin to live by our standards, if you want to get out of this. And he did. And then they said, hey, you got to come to church with us in order to do this. And I got to meet Cody and got to present the gospel to him. And he surrendered his life to Jesus. And he began to go, I want to be changed. But it was hard. It literally was physically painful for him. Because he had to go and go, man, my whole life was filled with hate. And it's represented by the swastika on my arm. And I want to be a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. I'm no longer going to live this way. So you know what he did? He had to go to the tattoo parlor. And I don't personally know this experience because I don't have tattoos because I'm a Christian. But for some of you, I just, just got to say it, because I'm pretty sure I'm the only person in our church that doesn't have a tattoo. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Uh, that was a joke. Obviously, we have everything wrong with tattoos. But he, he, he would had to go to the two, tattoo parlor over and over a couple dozen times to have this tattoo painfully removed from his arm. And it would be all red and kind of gross. And he would come through, and he'd be, it's worth it, because that is not who I am any longer. The transformation was occurring. Someone had reached out to him, presented the gospel to him, and like Jesus did, they poured into him, and he began to be discipled, and then he wanted to be changed by it. And then he said, I want to go back out and begin to live this out in people's lives and share what's happened to me. I want to tell you, God could change Cody, a neo-Nazi gang member. I know he could change you and what's going on in your life right now. And if the gospel of Jesus has no power in your life to transform you, what are we all doing here? Because if you're struggling in the up, the in, or the out relationship, the real complete surrender in all three areas of these lives, and you, you don't want to lead a balanced life. You want to do it your own way. I got this figured out. Don't tell me what to do. I don't need to change. I'll do what I want. I'll have the outcome I want. I want to encourage you that you can change and that it is worth it, but it will come with pain. And as he did that, he began to not just have it physically removed from his body, his spiritual growth began to change with that. And that's what happens every step. It's a process, layer by layer. God's not giving up on you. Don't give up on him. He has a plan and purpose for your life. He used a bunch of uneducated teenagers to change the world. And we're all gathered today all around the world worshiping God because of it. So I know he could use you. I don't know which of those three areas is your struggle right now, but I want to encourage you to get back up on the bike and not give up because with some pain you've experienced it, more pain's going to come, but it's going to be worth it. It's going to bring purpose and meaning to your life. And so I'm going to give you an opportunity here for the committed Christian to say today, I'm not going to get lazy anymore. I'm going to begin to work on this area. I'm either going to just be with Jesus in that up vertical relationship. I'm going to get discipled or make disciples, or I'm going to go live out on mission. I'm going to be transformed by him. And it's some of us here. You're here in this room right now. You gather together to worship God on a weekend. People don't do that in our culture today. You're attending live online. You could have done something else with your time right now. And you chose to be here. And I want to tell you, if you don't know Jesus, if you had, don't know that when you, go to, when you die that you are going to heaven, if you don't know that God is in your life now and you feel all alone, I want to tell you, I've seen it for two decades, that if you trust your faith completely in Jesus Christ, the transformation I have described can actually occur. And you could be a former fraternity guy that just was selfish about his life and be transformed and lead Bible studies to the very people that you used to party with. And so God can use you here today. And I want to give you the opportunity to surrender your life fully to Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me, God, first for those in the room who are Christian who have known you for a while 
But maybe there's an area, probably all of us, we have an area this weekend that we know, man, that's, that's what I got to work on. If that's you in the room, pray this with me. I invite you in to that area of my life, Jesus. Use me. Transform me. I surrender that all to you, every aspect of my life and mission. And then for those who may be in the room right now that have never fully surrendered their life to Jesus Christ or are attending online, pray this right now with me and mean it. God knows what's going on in your mind and your soul. Pray this with me. God, I confess that I'm not perfect and I need you. On this day, I begin the process of learning from you as my rabbi. And I surrender my life to you fully, Jesus. I believe and receive your grace and forgiveness. I believe that you rose from the grave, overcoming death itself, that I could know you today and spend eternal life with you. So I surrender my entire life to you and repent of anything in my life that's not of you. God, we love you. We trust you with our eternity. And we surrender our lives to you. We pray this in Jesus Christ's holy name and all God's family said, amen. amen.